Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Safest Social Media Show. I'm your host, Brigitte Limbanda. I am a Goodwill um, ambassador and a live streaming advocate. I started my career raising awareness about the water crisis in South Africa, and I produce and host online shows and lead conversations with entrepreneurs and thought leaders. My amazing co-host is Alison Diamond. Alison is a sociologist and a social media enthusiast, and she's concerned about disinformation and malicious behavior. She takes a sociological approach to examining the problems and to find user-based solutions. And today our conversation is about naming and shaming. So on this show, which is called The Safer Social Media Show, we talk about how we as individuals can gain the ability to take a more critical look at the things we see online and how we can become more selective about how we use that information that we see online uh, and how that leads to freedom of disinformation. But today we're specifically talking about naming and shaming. So hello, Alison. Hello. How are I'm you? Fine. I'm fine, how are you? Yes, that is great. So I want to let everyone know, welcome to the show first of all. Um, Today we are talking about nox, doxing as well as naming and shaming. And I want to let you know that we are live on different platforms. We are live on LinkedIn, on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Twitter. So wherever you are watching us on your uh, social media platform of choice, welcome to the show. And I wonder if we should kick off first by just explaining or giving a brief outline of what both doxing or naming and shaming um, is about. Sure. So I'd, I'd kick that off with saying that it involves researching the details of people's lives with malicious intent. It's not just that you're just looking for someone's contact details or wanting to reach out to them. You're doing this with intent to make the details public. Um, and your intention is to harass to abuse, to provoke fear, uh, to even cause violence or physical harm to that person and or their family members. So it's a kind of a vigilante justice, if you wanted to say. So you're kind of taking the law in your own hands. Yeah. I, I'm going to define doxing, but what you've heard about naming and shaming in general uh, does describe doxing, and I tend to see naming and shaming as sort of doxing right, because uh, naming and shaming is pretty bad, and it's meant to embarrass and humiliate and, um, you know, incite violence, like she said, but I think of doxing as taking it to another level. Uh, the idea of doxing is that you find documents, that's where the word comes from, uh, about the person, personal information. Sometimes you receive it through um, hacking, and sometimes you just get it off of public sites and you make it easily compilable in one place so everybody around the world, this unknown audience of people can pile on um, and join the fray, often without knowing fully what it's all about. And this person and their family um, are is victimized and um, it's really, it causes a lot of problems obviously for victims. Uh. Yeah, it's 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 a minefield that um, needs addressing because you know it's 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 something that we cannot ignore. It happens more and more, and sometimes it even leads to depression, people taking their lives, um, and so I think one needs to discuss whether we as individuals need to do something about it, whether it's okay, should we wait for legislation? Um, and so would you say that that one can justify doxing or naming and shaming by means of extenuating circumstances? Do you think it's okay? Um, gosh, I, I don't like the practice, although I think the only way that I would support it is for uh, reasons where all of us are affected by it. For example, um, for transparency in government. Um, if there are things that we need to know, uh, then and the government is unwilling to provide that information, and we have a legal right 
in the moral right to know it, um, then I don't have a problem with it being leaked or, you know, however it's done. Um, but I don't like malicious doxing. Um, I, you know, anything that's meant to harm somebody, no way, that's not justified. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fine um, line there. And I think, you know, one has to make that dis distinction um, about whether or not it is something that you would engage in. Does the, does, you know, um, I think for me personally, I would want to consider the consequences of taking part in doxing. Yeah. Um, you know, it may seem that you're justified, but you do walk the fine line of looking at criminal prosecution, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, irrespective of what that person did, what if that person takes their life, for example? Would, you know, you make yourself liable for culpable homicide? Yeah, um, one of the things um, about doxing and maybe in chaining in general is that really the laws that we have today haven't kept up with our digital abilities, so to speak. So we've got people who are really at home with the internet and social media and with all the things that you can do um, with technology to cause harm. But we've got people who make the laws who don't understand all that underlying technology and our laws don't change as quickly as our behaviors do. So right now, uh, people are using um, harassment, stalking laws, um, domestic violence, I mean, anything you can reach out for, um, hate crimes, at least in this country, I don't know, maybe you know a little bit about what's happening in, in um, South Africa. But here, um, we've, got, um, we've got a little ways to go to uh, specify doxing. Um, across the country as a, as a crime and really define it. I think that's probably a, an issue worldwide that there isn't a, it's not well enough defined or well enough or documented well enough. And I see a huge problem that the law, I mean, in, in, in the US, for example, your law will, will differ from state to state. And the laws differ from country to country. And I often wonder whether that isn't what gives people the, the freedom or the loophole um, to engage in naming and shaming mm -hmm. because they understand that if they commit the crime of naming and shaming and doxing across a border, um, they will likely not be prosecuted. Yeah, um, there are ways that the laws, the current laws can be exploited because they don't uh, match the crime exactly um, or they may be overreaching. Um, so yeah, these loopholes are abused. So yeah, we have a, a ways to go and we have to rely on you know the pre-digital era laws and any kind of amendments that have come along. But uh, yeah, un unfortunately, uh, we don't really have a, a unified way of addressing doxing or naming and shaming. So, I, you know, on our Twitter chat, we did ask people what they thought um, should be done, and uh, you actually had a, a response. Um, I don't know if you can remember right off hand, kind of look at our, our Twitter chat and um, pull up some things, but we did put it out there to people what you, what you think. Um, should be done if there were if there were legislation against uh, doxing, what would be an adequate punishment? Well, um, to me, there's one of the things I would suggest is you know depending on the severity of the offence, is taking away that person's ability to be on social media entirely, either for a period of time or permanently if, if, if it's severe enough. Mm -hmm. But in order for us to reach that kind of point, um, the providers of the social media platforms would have to put in specific mechanisms in place to circumvent what people currently do. People may think they're hiding, but 
the systems allow people to create fake profiles mm -hmm. you know um, on Facebook for example people don't even hide the fact that they may Twitter you know Facebook may say well we don't allow it on our platform but that there's no mechanism to stop people from having as many profiles as they like on Facebook for yeah. example um, the same on YouTube you know you can have as many profiles as you like on Twitter it's a free for all yeah. you can have you know even if you get banned under the one um, username people will come back and say well hey I'm back and this is my new username follow me mm -hmm. and if they have a large following they have absolutely no difficulty with switching usernames whatsoever it is that easy mm -hmm. and Facebook, so um, on Facebook I know there's a policy where they really started pushing for people to use their real names so I don't know if you remember that um, but if you had a nickname um, and some of my friends do have nicknames um, some of them were forced early on to switch to a legal name so I think that was part of Facebook's way of you know quitting uh, or start making people quit with the anonymity and maybe uh, be a little more intimidated about being, uh, you know, online bullies or making nasty comments. But you know what? I have seen some things under people's real names, so uh, I'm not sure it really evaded a lot of that, but, uh, but at least that was one of the policies they implemented. I know that implemented the policy, you know, but it's, it's, it's again, it's one thing about, you know, having a policy in place is one thing but enforcing that policy and having consequences for not adhering to the policy is quite another exactly. so you know i mean i i know of numerous people who still despite that policy um still have numerous profiles on mm -hmm. facebook they haven't changed anything because there's no um there's no consequences mm -hmm. for having more than one profile you know how is that enforced right. um, you know you can use any combination of anything and make up a profile on Facebook because it's not linked to your ID or your social security it's not linked to anything there's no mechanism of checking um, to say you know who you say you are well they can't even check your age you know? so we have a lot of people who are underage I think it's 13 or 12 for Facebook um, who just say they're older, you know, so they can see everything. Um, and that's common on YouTube as well. So, yeah, and, and the other problem is that the platforms don't evenly apply their policies to everyone. So, you know, we just had this uh, battle going on on YouTube uh, with the, the uh, person who was gay bashing. And YouTube says, well, that's, um, those are opinions. Those are strong um, opinions, not, um, you know, hate speech, right? And then you've got on Facebook and Twitter the controversy over the doctored videos that were, you know, that was used to make, um, uh, you know, well, here in, in the United States, I know I'm being specific um, to what's happening here, but, you know, doctoring the videos and using it politically against uh, the Democrats. And Facebook would not take it down. Um, they said that they limited its reach. And then a new doctor video, a deep fake video came out with uh, um, Zuckerberg as the as a target. And so everybody was wondering, are you going to leave that video up too? And they kind of had to, you know, because they have to be fair. But um, yeah, I mean, how are they, how are these platforms even going to keep up with different ways that people use technology to harm others? Mm. You know, I see that this as one of the huge challenges is that the platforms, you know, I was doing a bit of research earlier on um, on Facebook, for example. Now, Twitter says that they don't permit doxing or naming and shaming, and yet it's rife. It's absolutely rife. It's like a free-for-all on Twitter when it comes to doxing and naming and shaming, and yet they say it's against their policies. But... I don't see them enforcing it or the way that they enforce it is not even handed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, there's, there's so many different interpretations. Now, I, I had a look at Facebook, for example, um, you know, in terms of, so they've got variations of what they 
um, would recognize as naming and shaming. Mm -hmm. um, and I found, you know, there were discrepancies in terms of racial demographics that um, made themselves guilty of naming and shaming. And Facebook seems to discriminate on the basis of racial profiling when it comes to naming and shaming. And there's so many gray areas. And I think that's probably one of the issues that we've got is that the social media platforms can't even agree on a definition. Um, I mean, and the until is it's humans making these decisions and humans have their own biases hidden or open and, uh, and those influence the decisions that they make. That's where all this, you know, uneven um, application of these policies is coming from. It's because these different platforms have different agendas. So one of the things I saw on Facebook, for example, that people were uh, complaining about is the fact that the moderators um, may be of a certain ethnicity or social status or, or whatever, and it's left entirely up to them uh, to make that decision. In other words, you're not having a, I don't know if one should call it a, a board or a panel, for example, made up of various demographics that could make a better combined decision than leaving it up to one person, for example, that's of a different demographic graphic, and they may say, well, you know, I, I think it's okay. I, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but that's how it seems from a public perspective. And yeah, that's why there's no even, yeah. Anyway, I think we can, you know, we need to work towards something. Something needs to change because the current status quo is not is not working for us. So an interesting thing is if you were caught doxing or naming and shaming um, and you actually made yourself criminally liable, um, you cannot escape the consequences. And I think that is one thing that you need to consider, mm -hmm. that there may be legal consequences because we we talked about this last week as well, you know, and again, I want to reiterate that I do believe that Facebook does need to take, and I, I know I'm harping on one social media platform, but I believe that they conditioned us to like and share too quickly, you know, we've been conditioned over a period of time to do that. And so people don't take a second to think about the consequences. Yeah. We're too quick on liking and sharing. Um, and and once you've done that, you know, I think a, a, an aspect that we, that we forget about the internet is that it's so easy to screenshot anything and everything. So even if you um, decide to delete that tweet, or you decide to leave that Facebook post, chances are high that someone out there have screenshot your post or your tweet already. And so perhaps that leads into a, another question of, you know, how do we keep safe online, would you say? What are some of the things that we could do to keep ourselves safe? Well, um, you know, obviously we can't control what other people do to us, but um, what we can do now is take a look at all the profiles um, that we have on different platforms. If you ever use Twitter, if you ever use MySpace, if you were ever on Hello, if you were ever on any, even platforms you just forgot that you used to be interested in, um, go back and see if you can log into those. If you can't, recover your password, delete those profiles if you're not using them. Um, the idea is to get rid of anything that is not needed by you. You can always recreate a profile if you want to, but get rid of anything you're not using. Um, I would also go back and look at um, past posts. Maybe you were a little too forthcoming about your personal data. We've talked about this before where, um, you know, for fun, your friend might post a, a list of questions online What's your favorite this? What's the street you grew up on? Um, all that's kind of fun until somebody uses it 
and you know knows your personal information and can use it as part of an attack. Uh, and it doesn't have to be for doxing. I mean, just knowing those things gives people enough information to try to get into your account because these accounts use questions like, what street did you grow up on? What is your mother's maiden name? And those are things you may have innocently answered when your friend posted those quizzes. So go back, delete that stuff. Um, so that's a couple of, of ideas. Um, also, strong passwords um, make it more difficult for people to get into your accounts um, and to see your, your personal data. And I have to name this before I turn it back to you for your ideas. Um, there are websites online that do collect that information about you. Uh, for example, mylife.com. You can actually write to some of these sites or look up their policies and then submit a request to have your data removed. So that's a, an idea um, to see if you can lock your, your data away. So um, those are three things. <coughs> You mentioned something interesting, you know, about how you could innocuously have posted something um, in the past. And and sometimes, you know, you can have something very innocent, people starting a remember when kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in that conversation of remember when, you could be releasing personal data about yourself or your family. Yeah. Um, without giving it a second thought. And once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, airing your dirty laundry because um, you're having a fight with your brother or your ex or your current spouse and putting all that out there, you're just handing people your personal life information. And, uh, and who knows who's going to be able to use that in the future. We all already know that when you're looking for a job, um, you might not want your future boss to see that fight you have with your, with your neighbor, you know, you need to be careful about the personal stuff that you're posting. Alison, you've you've just touched on something now that is is almost a, a trap for doxing or naming and shaming, and that is an aggrieved spouse or ex-spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, you know, you often see this on social media, someone that feels aggrieved because the relationship went sour, and um, and so almost as a means of revenge, they will release personal information about the ex-partner. Yeah, um, pictures. Yeah, and it can get incredibly nasty. And I think very often in the heat of the moment, you may not think about how that could affect you personally, you know, for that job promotion, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, or whatever else may come up in your in your career, and so one's got to. And I, I think for me, the take home from our conversation is that you need to unlearn what Facebook has taught us mm -hmm. to hit the share and like button so quickly. You need to hit the pause button instead. Yeah, and I, I think and and think about the consequences. Right. I also think that your tone and the things that you find worth saying, you need to think about twice. A lot of us, myself included, uh, will have a knee-jerk reaction in a, in a group, maybe a Facebook group where you're talking about whatever, and somebody says something you don't like, or they say something insulting, and so you insult that person back without, you know, it's so easy to do. Just hit the comment, just hit reply. You don't have to think. So you can go back and forth as if you were talking, and we forget that we always have that choice to pause. We don't have to post, and we can delete it. You know, it doesn't have to be there forever. Delete it if you said something. But but think about what you do and say before you do it. Because just because Facebook says you can do it and then encourages you to do it, doesn't mean it's in your best interest. I think that's kind of a, a light bulb point there. You know, just because something is legal doesn't mean it's morally right or it doesn't mean that it will abscond you from the consequences um, of your actions. And so whether or not a platform permits something or allows something to happen will also not free you from the consequences. You know, so if, if Facebook has permitted a post to go through that causes harm or Twitter or which, you know, YouTube, whatever, 
But if that results in harm to another person and you become criminally liable, it's very likely that the platform isn't going to offer you blanket kind of protection and pay, you know, to keep you out of jail or free you from the consequences. Yeah. So I think we need to sit back and realize that whatever we do at the end of the day, we can and will be held re responsible in our personal capacity. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And those are real people at the other end. You know, it's easy, easy to just see them as a, a, you know, a smart aleck name and a, or a nickname or something, you know, and, and attack the person for that name, you know, because the person has a different political view or, you know, something like that. And, and we do that all the time because the name is provocative, they do it on purpose, and they're there to kind of incite something. And so we respond, oh, you, you probably like so-and-so, you're probably a blah, blah, blah. We've all seen that. And then before you know it, it's back and forth and about nothing. You don't even know each other. So mm -hmm. we, it, we've been taught by social media uh, to have those kind of interactions. Not, you know, this wasn't the intention, but that's what it's become. I think you've kind of just, you know, reminded me about an aspect that we may not think about often is is the fact that because we are not forced to show our real pictures on social media people hide behind avatars and any picture of their choice you know mm -hmm. they even steal someone else's image these days and that happens if yeah that happens every single day and so i wonder if that doesn't add to dehumanizing the person on the other side because you yeah. don't think of them as being human you just look at this profile mm -hmm. that you know um and i'm going all in to attack this profile and we forget that behind that profile is a human being mm -hmm. with a family to support yeah. um you know and and more so behind that profile is somebody with feelings with a life mm -hmm. um, and so yeah I think I think somehow we've lost the ability to humanize the connections and it's one of the things that I like about live streaming for example mm -hmm. it's because you know you can't hide <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah and you know, you, know you, you have to right. show the real you <laughs> you do, you do. Um, uh, and that's why um, Facebook is talking about switching to uh, a platform that's more like Snapchat, you know, which I love Snapchat. Um, and Snapchat does not have the same problems that Facebook has because um, the tools that Snapchat gives you encourages creativity and originality. It's not about, you know, forwarding what somebody else did and really not being yourself. You're just copying, you know, pictures and slogans and uh, infographics and whatever means without expressing who you are and showing the real person. So it's, it's a little bit harder to see somebody and be nasty towards them because that interaction is really based on curiosity and kindness and learning. I mean, that's what happens with face-to-face -face, um, interactions and Facebook wants to go in that direction. Yeah. Alison, we have come to the end of 30 minutes. I can't believe the time went by so quickly. So I want to just put this out there. If you have ever been the subject of naming and shaming or doxing, um, how did you deal with it? What did you what did you do? What were, you know, were there any consequences for people who engaged in this practice? Um, and I think another question I want to leave with you is if you see doxing or you see naming and shaming um would you engage would you encourage it would you discourage it would you turn the blind eye would you turn the other cheek and pretend you didn't see it do you look the other way let us know in the comments It'd be great to get some feedback because i think this is probably a this is a conversation we will be talking about again for sure Anyway, any closing thoughts, Alison? Uh, well, um, really, I just want to say that um, what Safer Social Media is all about is starting that conversation and continuing it and building on skills that we're learning and um, applying out those skills to other situations and seeing how they fit. 
um, were really about grassroots uh, attempts to make the, the internet safer for ourselves. The idea is that we cannot wait for legislation, we can't wait for platforms to come up with laws. We need to start looking out for ourselves and taking on safer behaviors on our own. And so we are going to share that information with you and hopefully we'll have guests um, who will, you know, share some tips on their own. We've got some great um, conversation on Twitter and uh, some just really great ideas. So I'm looking forward to more. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And um, we look forward to hearing your, your comments and your views and we will definitely be having this conversation again. So from me, Bridgette and Band in Cape Town, it's goodbye for now. Adios from Las Vegas.